This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. You're listening to Place to Be Nation's main event, a roundtable experience looking at today's pro wrestling landscape. And now, here's your host, Scott Criscolo. Place to be nation. Welcome back to your home for everything. Flame throwing around the world. And back again. Place to be nation's main event. I'm your co-host, Scott Criscolo. Uh, we, of course, are back to... We're on a different schedule now because last week... Uh, was Thanksgiving, so we did not have a show, but we're back this week, and we got a lot to talk about. As a matter of fact, uh, we got a lot of news to get into tonight, um, particularly in the second segment, uh, where we are going to talk some uh, New Japan and some uh, some TNA or some Impact. Well, TNA, depending on the era, because we got some new fun stuff we're going to debut now uh, here at Main Event and uh, have a little fun uh, in more ways than one. But let me bring in uh, the cast of characters this evening. First, my co-host. Uh, on the, I just can't remember, uh, Mark Bavaro episode of main event, because he's the only 89 I can think of. He is the co-host of the Kings of Sport, and uh, if he's wearing a Mark Bavaro jersey, then he's being pretty good to the team that's getting beat up tonight, today, in the local New York radio, the godfather, Nate Milton. What is going on, Scotty? Uh, I am not wearing a Bavaro jersey, uh, since I am someone who is... Uh, I guess you could say short in stature, but uh, but large in spirit. I'm wearing my Steve Smith jersey because I feel we share a kinship. There you go, Steve Smith, who is now on NFL Network, of course. Uh, X, you wearing a Panther or Ravens? You're wearing a Panthers, obviously. Oh, I'm def- definitely rocking the Panthers. I, I, I love Panthers. those colors. Love those. Reminds yep. me of Kevin Green when he came to Nitro. That's right, and then got turned on. <laughs> <laughs> Except he didn't wear the Panthers, though. He wore the Steelers, didn't he? Did he wear the Panthers jersey? I thought he wore the Steelers jersey. Maybe he wore the maybe he did wear the Panthers. I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, our other uh, gentleman this evening uh, is a fan of the team of the <laughs> fan of the team who the guy that played for them turned on Kevin Green, <laughs> but he was not on. But he was not on episode seventy six. So I don't know who number eighty nine would be uh, on the Chicago Bears. He's probably wearing it right now. But he is, of course, the conscience of Place to Be Nation. Welcome back, Mister Steve Willie. Well, you know, I was going to wear my Bears jersey, but there is a certain Bear who is very famous who wore the 89, who is mm. also on the Dallas Cowboys. <gasps> so today I'm wearing my 89 Mike Ditka yes. Dallas Cowboys jersey. That is correct. I will, not be a, I will not be a giant knob with outdated tape, <laughs> and, I will, and I did not drunk drive to get here. <laughs> and, you know, and of course, Ditka won a ring with the uh, Cowboys. He was on yeah. the Cowboys when they won Super Bowl six. So he actually caught a touchdown pass in that game from Roger Stallmark, the Dodger. Uh, gentlemen, uh, it's good to have you on, of course, Nate, co-host. And of, uh, uh, Steve, thanks for carving a little time. Um, it is, a, as I mentioned, episode 89 of the main event. Um, obviously, a lot's going on uh, in the world of uh, the big flamethrower, which we'll talk about in this segment. In our second segment, uh, we hope to have Aaron George join us. Uh, Aaron George, one of my, actually, maybe my favorite Canadian, I think. Uh, he's been on many a podcast. He's lately have been on Making the Cut with my PIC, Mr. Rosero, talking about their uh, the PWWE, uh, com- well, not really competition, but our big project. We're doing at PlacementNation.com. Uh, everybody doing their top 100 greatest WWE wrestlers of all time. I cannot wait till we do our post-mortem podcasts when Nate tries to f- uh, really legitimately explain why Nia Jax is number three. Um, notice I didn't put him at number one because you can't be that crazy. Uh, although you are the godfather, so maybe you are that crazy. But anyway, uh, just to give everyone a reminder, your ballots are due December 31st. So you've got, uh, what, 30, well, as we're recording now, you have, what, 33 days to get your ballot in and uh, check everything out at placebenation.com and on the Place to Be Nation Facebook page. Actually, there's a specific uh, PWWE group page. So check it out. Check out all the great podcasts and pod blasts we have uh, in the archives of of all of the uh uh, shows we've done uh, talking about the top 100 and nominees and such and uh, Aaron and uh, JR did a nice uh, did five making the cuts I listened to the last two 
uh, and they were they were exceptional. So they had a pretty good, interesting debate or uh, discussion about uh, Bret Hart, Mick Foley, CM Punk. Pretty good. So check it out. Check all the stuff on PlaceBeNation.com pertaining to the greatest WWE wrestler of all time project we are doing. Uh, and of course, brother Nate, you and I will be uh, post New Year's. Uh, we will be doing our uh, some uh, uh, some post mortem shows. Maybe we'll do a little reveal show. What do you think? A hundred to ninety, eighty nine to eighty. What do you think? Do you think, think you could do? Do you, do, you, do you think you could do nine podcasts before Nia Jackson number three? What do you think? I mean, of course, we have to build up to Nia Jackson, and, and I didn't have her at number three. I, I think that's just uh, ludicrous of you to suggest that. <laughs> uh, of course. Of course, she was number five, though. You oh, know? okay, all right, all right. It was it was down to the wire. I'm like, hmm, Hogan, Naya, <laughs> Hogan, Naya, and and you know, I, I had to go with Hogan. I figured as much, but but Savage got bumped for Naya, so that's all right. Um, <laughs> Savage always got bumped for Hogan, anyway. And uh, Steve Willie, uh, yes, you do realize that you know it's only WWE guys, so just let you know. I I uh, I will judge everyone. I might not make a list, but I will. I will <laughs> judge everybody. <laughs> yes. Uh, Cheeks is number one hundred on my countdown. Um, and speaking of Cheeks, we're going to actually talk about Cheeks uh, in a few weeks. <gasps> look at that! Look at that tip I just did. Anyway, uh, let's let's talk about the flamethrower guys. Uh, obviously, uh, Survivor Series happened a few weeks ago, so we won't go too crazy into Survivor Series because it's been it's been a couple weeks. But Nate, any just general thoughts on Survivor Series? We won't go too deep into it. Uh, actually, Survivor Series and NXT Takeover. War games, which wasn't really war games. It was like faux games. Um, but I'll get into that in a minute on my comments. But, Nate, any just general comments on the weekend, NXT and, uh, and Survivor Series? Uh, NXT was good, as always, with their TakeOver special. I thought the war games, while not being 100% married to the traditional NWA, WCW war games, uh, it, it was a good match and certainly much better than the, uh, the uh, NWO version of war games with the Ultimate Warrior from back in the day. Uh, so I thought NXT was good. So, uh, Survivor Series was a mixed bag for me. I thought there were some really strong matches on there, particularly Cena, uh, Cena particularly Lesnar and uh, AJ. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed the uh, Shield versus the New Day. Um, I thought the show was still a little bit too long. And then, of course, at the end, uh, much to my chagrin, uh, Triple H is going to Triple H. And uh, I-, I had thoughts and, and, and opinions about uh, the outcome of that main event. Uh, Steve, what were your uh, overall thoughts of the weekend? Um, I yeah, I loved NXT. Uh, I thought it was a really strong show from top to bottom, and I went into it thinking that this might be one of the lesser shows. I thought it might be like a, a one match show because of the war games and some of the you know, there's a lot of turnover in the roster. Uh, I thought the women's match was outstanding, uh, a lot better than I thought it was going to be. The The real surprise for me was the Alistair Black Velveteen Dream match, because I, I, I've only seen Velveteen Dream once, and it was at a, a house show up by us, and he was against Gargano, and I, I, he just didn't have that character work down yet, and I, I thought that match was brilliant. Um, it was actually my match of the night, and I, I would have to like look back, but possibly my second my second favorite match after uh, AJ Brock, which if you're looking at Survivor Series, I, I that going into it, I thought the the that match and the main event were the ones to see. But uh, Brock Lesnar and AJ delivered, and I think the uh, the fans kind of let you know what they thought of the match and my thoughts on the match when they were cheering for all the newer guys. Not necessarily the younger guys, you know, like Bobby Roode was getting a lot of cheers. Nakamura was getting a lot of cheers. The place went bananas when Nakamura and Balor faced off. And then as all of those newer guys fell by the wayside and it ended up being, you know, Shane and Triple H and uh, and Kurt, it just got quiet. And, uh, you know, luckily Braun was there to to Braun them all over and and saved it a little bit. Uh, In terms of the war games... I thought I thought um, it was first of all it was very weird to see Roderick Strong, who's usually in a pair of black briefs and his shitty little boots, <laughs> uh, wear wear the authors of pain gear. I know and combat boots. That was that weird. was really weird. Yeah. Um, I thought that they would have showcased uh, Undisputed Era a little bit more, and I was surprised. And uh, perhaps they and I've seen O'Reilly do some really good kind of hardcore type matches. I think one of them was even with Adam Cole, but it just seems that they're an afterthought until the very end. 
Mm. Mm. Um, I thought overall, uh, uh, War Games was the show. The show itself was very good. I, I'm very happy that that my girl Ember Moon finally got uh, the NXT yes. Women's Title. She finally got it. With uh, they got they got away with it without having to Oscar a job, and it was good to see Oscar be there to uh, hand her the belt, and that was that was awesome. So uh, that was a good moment. Um, I can't believe, but good for him that Andrade. Uh, Andrade Cien Almas is your new NXT champion, which I thought was kind of odd because I feel like he was the guy next to No Way Jose that just jobs to all the new cool guys that come in. Because I do yeah. remember, of course, I was in Brooklyn uh, two years ago when he laid down for Bobby Roode in Bobby Roode's mm. first match. Uh, so I was kind of surprised. But you know what? Almas is going to be like one of those AAA guys that's never going to um, – that was probably never make the big leagues. So he might as well get a decent run with the NXT belt because Drew McIntyre is – is probably once he's healed, he'll probably be up in the one of the two shows at some point. Um, so I think I think he was going to lose anyway. So that's that's fine. Good for good for Almas. I'm happy for him. And he, you know he's got a good looking valet. So and valets always help you win titles. Um, as for war games, yes, uh, it wasn't real war games. Number one, um, there's no roof, so that was stupid. I don't know why we didn't need a why there wasn't a roof. I know that War Games normally doesn't use the roof, but although the roof almost killed Pillman in 1991, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's why I was I wasn't too upset about that uh, with the roof. I know some people were I'm like, man, uh, yeah, Pillman almost died on that. Thing. Yeah, uh, and number two, um, they put like this metal like found I don't know it was like a girder or something or a foundation thing in between the two rings now see I like the danger of uh, losing your leg between the two rings like in the old NWA day so I thought they were being too safe but not just me being a sadist but <laughs> otherwise I thought it was good I, although the, it wasn't really the right the rules weren't it, shark cages I mean what the fuck I mean come on <laughs> shark cages give me a break it's stupid and th- that metal part uh, it was either Cole or O'Reilly got thrown in between and kind of fell really hard on his arm. And I'm like, man, that, that might have actually done more damage yeah. than having the the little bit between the ropes. Because they didn't do that much with the two rings. Uh, um, be, well, the, the two rings really were more there just because there was so much beef in the ring. At once you it was able to you were able to do a lot more. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. Um, I mean, I'm glad we finally got it. We've been talking about it for years. Um. And obviously, you know, Triple H and Vince had to do some type of compromise. So Vince is like, yeah, you can put the war games on your little tiny Saturday show, but I'm not pissing away floor seats <laughs> for this match, which I used to talk about. for that. That's the reason, really. Okay. Um, it's got nothing to do with booking or anything. It's just Vince doesn't want to give up. I mean, I, don't, I mean, you think about it. How many floor seats does he probably lose? Um, A couple hundred. 30? For, well, no, if he, well, not are. 30. The ring itself probably takes up. It's 20 by 20, so 400 square feet. Yeah, so you're figuring 50 seats, probably. 50 or 60 seats. And that's, you know, a couple hundred each, at least. I mean, NXT, it's not it's not like, you know, WrestleMania. So, I mean, floor seats at NXT is probably, what, maybe 250, 300, maybe tops. And that's 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 even pushing. Even though it's a takeover, even 300 might be pushing it. So and, hey, it's not, it's not like they sold out. No, exactly. So, so they probably lost, you know, a few thousand, but whatever. They probably made it back Sunday. Um, and Monday and Tuesday because they stayed at the Toyota Center in Houston for all, for the whole uh, for the whole weekend. Um, Sunday, um, overall, I enjoyed the show. I thought the tag match was pretty good. the The opener with the Shield and, and New Day. Uh, those guys just are good together. Roman, uh, Seth, and Dean. I mean, this is best Dean's looked in. <laughs> it's the most entertaining Dean's been in like a year. Um, I don't know we've kind of bashed him Nate on occasion here, but. Um, and I think you're slowly, and maybe I'm crazy, and I'm, I'm curious your guys' opinion. I'll start with you, Steve. I feel like the Shield, I know he still gets booed, but I kind of think that maybe we're over the whole Roman booing, Roman sucks thing now. I think we're kind of getting over it now. A combination yeah, of two I... things. The, the number one, that, that he's in the Shield, and the Shield's cool. And number two, that, as we saw in Raw a week ago, uh, he is your new Intercontinental Champion. He beat the Miz because the Miz going to do the Marine 56. Um, so, are, are we over it now? Is everybody over it now? Can we move on, Steve? <laughs> Nate can't move um, on, but... <laughs> I, I think there will be your 
more smarky crowds, maybe at your bigger shows, that there'll be the booze. But, I mean, even with this past Monday on Raw when he was against Elias, there were, you know, the Shield wasn't even with him for that match, and he was getting cheered. Yeah. And they did the whole hoo-ah when, before he did the set up for the spear, which a lot of times they'll boo for it. Right. And uh, it, it definitely seemed like about 100% of the crowds with them. I hope that it start, that stops. It's I get why it was going on, like, say, two years ago, mm-hmm. but it's, that's, it's, it's enough. It's enough. And it's, at some point, it's not cool anymore. It's just like, yeah, you're, you're just doing it because everyone else is doing exactly. it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Brother Nate, uh, we've been critical of, of Roman at times. Um, and I think it was JR made a good point in one of our chats that had, had Roman, let me ask you this, had this happened for Roman... This little stretch now happened at the end of 2014. Big mid-card stud, wins the IC belt, solid feuds, doesn't get shoved down our throats into 2015. Had they did it then? Now, obviously, you know, late 2014, he's trying to avoid the whole suffering succotash nonsense, but would would had this happened three years ago, would we be having even this discussion? If they just, if they did this in 2014, for three years ago, I don't even know if it's a time thing because if you remember when Roman initially broke off from the Shield, he was still, for the most part, being treated with, if not outright adoration, uh, at least respect from the crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think along the way, he kind of got put into the same box that Dave Batista did during his last run, mm-hmm. where. We don't really have a beef with you, but you're not the one we want to see, so we're going to take it out on you. Where Batista got all that heat for not being Daniel Bryan, basically. Right, right. And I think Roman just kind of, it was a combination between, A, I think the booking just got worse for him, and he got involved in some feuds that didn't do much for him. Uh, chiefly, the, the Bray Wyatt feud uh, stands out to me as one that really didn't help Roman. Uh, but I also think that, the the kind of we want somebody else we just don't know who we want uh, but we know we don't want you I, I think it just kind of became the cool thing to do like Steve was alluding to and, and so I would hope that it's gonna die down a little bit but the realist in me knows that once we get in, into mania season and we get into these bigger shows that are in quote unquote hardcore towns and uh, particularly when you get that WrestleMania crowd he's still gonna get booed. And I don't think there's much they can do to uh, ebb that tide. But I, I do think this run has been good for him as well as it has for uh, Ambrose and Rollins. And, you know, I was watching the uh, Infinity War trailer today, and, and it kind of hit me as I, I was watching. I'm like, you know what? Roman Reigns is Hawkeye. Because when you look at Hawkeye, <laughs> you're, like, you're like, Hawkeye, okay, Hawkeye's cool, whatever, but I don't really want to see Hawkeye. But then when you, you put him in amongst the Avengers – and he shows up and, and, and saves Tony Stark with an arrow. You're like, yeah, I like Hawkeye. And I think that's that's what's going on right now. Roman is, is being bolstered by uh, his his reunite re, reunion with the Shield. That's the word. But I also think he's helping the other guys because Dean, like you said, hadn't felt like a big time player in at least a year. Uh, and Rollins has kind of been floundering. So I think this has been beneficial for all three guys. In Vince's eyes, Roman is Captain America, though. Yes, that's the thing. He's Hawkeye, but Vince wants him to be Captain America. It's exactly. Like, hey, man, exactly. I, I know Steve Rogers. I went to see Steve Rogers three times in the theater. And you, sir, know Steve Rogers. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Maybe Steve Rogers at the beginning of the first one, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've never disliked Roman. I, there's been moments where he's been – I didn't want him in a certain spot, and, and, yes. and three, you know, we're coming up almost on a three-year anniversary – of what happened in Philly in 2015, and and I'll be there next in a month and a half, and and I hope we don't see, it. I hope we don't have to see it again live, but uh, um, yeah, it's it's I, I'm ready for Roman to just be Roman, you know, let him just keep going along, and the fans will eventually just give up and move on. It's <laughs> honestly that's that's my opinion. Um, let's talk about Dean for a minute. Uh, him and Rollins have been a great tag team. I think Dean needed it. Uh, you know the Ellsworth stuff was pretty weak, and then everything after that's been pretty pretty lousy. Um, you know he was on the pre-show at WrestleMania. That speaks volumes. Um, Nate, 
has Dean changed at all from a year ago to now? Not particularly. I don't think Dean has changed. I think the perception of Dean is what's changed. You know, when you go from a guy on SmackDown who is mired in in, in uh, feuds with James Ellsworth or, God help him, Baron Corbin. Like, that stuff to me took more steam out of the character of Dean Ambrose. Uh, the, the WrestleMania match with Brock wasn't particularly great. I think those things took a lot of steam out of Dean Ambrose's sales. So I, I don't see this as some big change he's made. But I see it more in the way we see him and also the way that he's being presented. And I would hope that once this S.H.I.E.L.D. run comes to its, its its natural conclusion, that we don't get Dean stuck back in the same role and then they either you know find some way to turn him or if they're going to keep him babyface, find some way to take the momentum from the S.H.I.E.L.D. run and, and catapult the guy instead of sticking him back in these mid-card feuds and these angles where he's the wacky guy because I think that's played out. Mm. What do you think, Steve? Um, well, just a reminder, too, to pick up Kelly Thompson's Hawkeye from now on stands from Marvel Comics. <laughs> Shout out, Ben Morris. Um, I think that, uh, well, Dean's married. I mean, that's uh, a little bit of a difference from last year. Um, he was trying, when they did the brand split, they tried to present him as the guy. And he's really not a guy that can carry a show. And um, I didn't really think that was fair to put him in that position. Because right. he doesn't scream like... Like, you know, like a Cena or a Rock or a Roman Reigns, per se. Like, he's he's not someone who's going to connect with uh, little kids and... He's not even you know, AJ. No, no. Yeah, you got, especially when you got AJ right there. Um, so it, it kind of set him up for failure. And then when he was doing, like, the silly stuff with Jericho. And when what got him over was being a part of that unit. Right. You know, he wasn't really that over when he was down in, in FCW. He was, you know, a little bit of a, a crazy guy. When he was in the Indies, he was the crazy guy doing all the hardcore stuff. So he is better in a shield or maybe as another, um, I, I can't think of the word I'm going to use, like a, like a four horseman, a stable, like more of a right. stable as a part of a unit as opposed to just by himself. Um. Now, some other aspects from from Survivor, some other observations I took. The the women's match was not great. Um, in fact, it was pretty it was pretty bad actually, uh, surprisingly bad actually. Um, obviously, they're putting the rocket ship strapped to Asuka. and uh, I mean they don't have a pay per view until Fastlane, so they don't have a big show for Jesus two and a half months. So Raw is in a kind of a pickle here. Well, not really. I mean, it's WWE they do whatever they want, but uh, they don't have a big stage between now and I think it's February, like I don't know, eighteenth or something. Um, so I don't know how they can keep Oscar hot between now and and then. Uh, Steve, do you see her beating Alexa Bliss like any time in the next month? Or are they really going to milk this till till New Orleans? I think they're going to milk it, uh, and, and the reason I say that now is from Raw, when, by the way, that match with Dana Brooke was one of my favorite matches of the year, mm-hmm. where she won, and, I, I like, and I'm, not even being, I'm not even joking, that was legitimately awesome, like, the, the way that Dana came at her, and Asuka just did that jumping arm bar, and just kind of like, oh, yeah, I just did that, and kind of danced around a little bit, that, that was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know they seem to be going into some sort of angle with her and the uh, the absolution with with Paige and Sonya Deville and uh, and Mandy Rose and and God help us. But you know I, I don't know if they're going to try to add her on and then she'll just turn on them and go through them one by one and maybe lead up to something with her and Sonya Deville, um, who's got a ton of potential, and uh, and then move on to Paige and then have her move on to Alexa come New Orleans. Um, that would be my guess, you know, streak versus title. What do you think, Nate? What's the timeline you think for Asuka? Yeah, I think the introduction of the absolution has kind of stirred things up a bit. And I'm not sure if it's a good stirring up or a bad stirring up yet. Uh, because they've got some things to play with in terms of people's alignments. Like, how does Alexa Bliss factor into this? Because this can't be something where it's an isolated event. 
because, you know, they'd come in and make the statement and pages, you know, I'm taking the division back, whatever, whatever. So it has to affect everybody. And again, going to the world of comic books, you know, this this week they had the DC crossover on the CW. And an event happens, it doesn't just affect the Flash. You know, it affects the Arrow, and it affects Supergirl, and everybody else. So I'm interested to see how that plays out, because do we get a babyface Alexa Bliss coming out of this, perhaps? Because while she is technically a heel, she is somebody that gets a positive reaction a lot of times from the audience. So where, where does she fit in? Where does my girl Nia fit into all of this? So... I don't see them doing really much with the title uh, for the time being because I think they've got, in storyline, a, a bigger fish to fry, and that is this new group. Mm. Yes. Uh, let's talk about Paige. Wow, huh? Um, she's back. She looks good. She looks healthy. She doesn't look, like, you know, strung out and, and uh, you know, glazed. Um, the red lipstick, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get used to it. Uh, but I, I like the three of them and I know, I mean, Mandy, you saw her intermittently in NXT and then mostly, you know, on that, uh, on total divas and usually 80% of total divas is annoying. So, um, and I'm not apologizing for that, Ben, uh, but I, I think she's, she's fitting pretty well. She has some decent moves. Uh, DeVille, obviously she's got, she's like the badass. um, where do you see this this group going, Steve? From here forward, like, what's what do you think Paige's end game can be? Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, I just want to say, just in general, I was uh, surprised a little bit with some of those call ups. Um, they've really been hot perspective for a long time. If you like have the WWE app on your phone, like she's always on there for like top Mandy Rose Instagrams, even though you never really saw her that much performing on NXT. And the same could be said for like Liv Morgan over on SmackDown. I know we were really brought that up. Like that was again kind of a surprise. Um someone who really didn't win many matches and yet there she is. Um I, I think that, you know, kind of going with what I was saying that you know, they'll have Asuka work with them and at some point you know, they'll split up and, you know, Paige and, and Sonya Deville. I, I think they really have high hopes for Sonya Deville in terms of that MMA look. Um, and she's just got a boatload of potential. So um, and that's where I could see them going. Kind of, uh, again, surprised that some of these people are, are called up. But it mixes it mixes things up. You know, you have the women's revolution and you can only do so many... Uh, combinations of of the four people for so long, maybe five when you throw in Naomi. Um, and having six more people up on the roster uh, can give you a lot more variety, and I and I I support that. Well, we also have a rumor of a of a women's rumble too, so we need some bodies. Uh, Brother Nate, do you think that I mean there was some interaction Monday night with Oscar and these three? Uh, I mean, a, a page a page Oscar few to be pretty cool. Um, sadly, that would probably mean Alexa would have to take a back seat for a little while, which, I mean, it's not the end of the world. I mean, she's been at the top for a while. Um, what do you see the timeline for Asuka and, or for, for this group with Paige and where Asuka fits in? Yeah, the question becomes, is this, again, something that we see this group focusing in on Asuka because she is the, the, the hot new thing, even though they just came in recently as well? Or is this something where we see a, gr- a group form to counter them? You know, do we see Alexa and Asuka and, let's say, Naya band together? Or, or you know, where does this leave Sasha and Bailey and Mickey and so on and so forth? And so it's interesting because, like Steve said, you know, when they bring all these women up at one time, both in Absolution and also with the uh, Riot Squad, uh, don't forget to add the additional T, uh, I think that there's a lot of potential, but there's also the opportunity to kind of bungle this up and end up damaging some of these women because they might get lost in the shuffle. And I'm particularly thinking of Mandy. And I I think obviously there are some things aesthetically that I know the company wants to capitalize on, but I don't know. I don't know if she's at that level yet to be in top programs on the women's division on raw. Uh, Now in in terms of uh, Sonya, I think Sonya has got a different, problem altogether, which is, I think she's fantastic in the ring, but will that character be something that they are able to translate to this mainstream audience? Because 
let's not forget, you know, making that jump from NXT to the main roster has not always been the easiest of transitions. Not even for <laughs> somebody like Bailey. Like Bailey was super over in NXT, and we've seen how they've kind of, you know, messed up her run on the main roster. So I'm 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 optimistic for all of these girls, but at the same time, you know, booking is what booking is, and and we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's also uh, again, uh, like I said a minute ago. Uh, just getting bodies to to fill what's this rumored um, women's rumble. Yeah. Now, uh, AJ Brock was fantastic, and we'll talk more about AJ in a minute because we'll we'll focus a little bit on SmackDown because they have the big show coming up in what three weeks or two weeks actually, um, two and a half weeks. Uh, now the end of the show. Um, other than the fact that I think I may buy a new shirt. Um, because <laughs> he's allowed to have his own shirt. And fuck you if you don't like it. Um, it was very, it was very convoluted. I guess the point is, I didn't mind the theory. In theory, um, obviously everybody hates him, and that's that. Then he's doing his job, whether anybody likes it or not. And he got Braun over even more as as a monster, as a monster babyface at the end. The problem was. Getting from point A to point B yes. uh, was a little was a little wonky. It was a lot of like stalling shit at the end. Um, I didn't get Triple H attacking Kurt. I, I didn't get that. I don't know what the f- fuck the point of that was. Um, and then everything after that just seemed kind of like a mess. So, in theory, I got I understood where they were going, and I'm cool with it. But it, it admittedly it was executed pretty lousy. I'm I'm I, I'm fine with that. Um, Nate, did it help Braun? Did it hurt Braun, or was it lateral? Honestly, I think Braun might have been the only one who was helped by this match uh, because Steve already talked about it. you know some of the newer guys like a Nakamura, like a Bobby Roode, like a Finn Balor. You would think this would be an opportunity to elevate at least one or two of them along with Braun and and. For the most part, they kind of ended up looking like chumps. Uh, you also had the the Cena interaction, which you know, God bless uh, Big Match Johnny. Like I'm, I'm not one of these people who comes to crucify John Cena, but we could have basically done the same match without John Cena. Mm-hmm. Like I don't I don't think he added anything to the match besides his name. Uh, I'm I'm getting tired of Shane McMahon in these matches. Uh, I think it Shane Shane works to a point. But I think we're reaching the saturation point with Shane McMahon. Yep. And then, of course, we get back to Triple H. And I think Triple H is another guy that I think works really well in some of these big matches. But at the end of the night, for somebody who's supposed to be in storyline, the cerebral assassin, this wasn't like this wasn't a master plan. It just felt like something that he concocted on the fly. And and mm-hmm. I I didn't I didn't like it. I I think outside of him. Elevating Braun Strowman, which is always a good thing. Uh, I I didn't see a lot in this main event that I enjoyed. Like I think last year's uh, Survivor Series uh, main event was was better than this one. Like I, I was not a fan of this one. Uh, no, I wasn't. I, I overall I thought it was fine, but yeah, I'm kind of tapped on. And again, it's the Daniel Bryan thing. Of the two. Authority guys on SmackDown, we're getting too much of the one nobody wants to see anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and it ends up with him being look like placed in a position where he's supposed to be better than everyone else on the roster, like right. on SmackDown. Like put him with AJ at WrestleMania. You know, he's in the main event with Owens uh, in Hell in the Hell in the Cell, and then you know they just had the big angle with Owens and Zayn, and they're not even really part of the match and when they are they get clowned out in seconds right right i think the problem i have with the mcmahon family right now um oh is this like mad libs is it... <laughs> 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 um and then we went to the while well, Vince said he wanted to go touch his and you know um matt lauer matt lauer <laughs> yeah uh, you know i i gotta no uh, i'm not gonna get into it that was one that surprised me, i got to be honest, because I thought he was kind of scared of his own shadow. So sometimes you think about people. Charlie Rose, I could see him walking around like Ric Flair with his you know bathrobe open in, in his dressing room. But Matt Lauer, I thought, was kind of afraid of his own shadow. So that one kind of surprised me. But anyway, um, 
the, the, the one that. McMahon. Make fun with the McMahon family. Yeah, really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there won't be any sexual harassment problems at WWE, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> well, at least we, we hope not. <laughs> um, the one McMahon that needs to just never be on TV again is Stephanie. If you're not going to, even your father, and I'm saying this figuratively, not literally, even your father showed some ass once in a while. But to 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 castrate every single fucking baby face and then not show anything. Like, she, what did she get? The one bump a year. She took the bump from fucking Rollins at WrestleMania. Yeah. What, is, that's the one time that you get to, that, that, that someone gets back at you? Nah. Someone's got to sit down and tell her, listen, if you want to be your dad, your dad used to get the shit kicked out of him. I'm not, I mean, and, and I know we get the whole be a bully and she's a woman and I get all that. So I'm, I'm, you know, let's, let's, you know, I know some people are probably thinking that, but relax. All I'm saying is, is if she wants to come out there and, and pretend she's Vince 1998, uh, Steve used to beat the shit out of him and embarrass him constantly. Uh, so she's, she's got to let that happen to her. Her poor husband's the one that always gets the, gets the fucking shit beat out of him. Her brother's getting the shit beat out of him. Um, she's got to learn to, uh, you know, you got to, you got to do a little give and take with your character. You can't come in there. It, it'll meet to me. To me, the one match that they always drop the ball on, and I hope someday they return to it, is when uh, Charlotte was on Raw. And yeah. for a couple of weeks, you had this thing where it was like Stephanie was trying to intimidate Charlotte and saying her family was better than Charlotte's family. And I was like, they could go somewhere with this, but then I think, I want to say that got dropped due to the uh, Ronda Rousey deal yep. at Mania. Yep. But that, you know, her and Charlotte would, would be something interesting, or even her and Bailey. Like, her bullying Bailey could have been. Something great if they had chosen to go that route. And then they teased that for a while when Bailey came up as well. It was another tease that they did where right. she was kind of picking on on Bailey. Yeah, I'm fine with no. It's like uh, I've said the last few years. I'm fine with no more Undertaker. I'm fine with no more McMahon's on television. Uh, and Triple H, I'll throw you, you know, throw you the bone here, Scott. Like mm-hmm. Triple H, notwithstanding, that's a whole different story. But like in terms of Stephanie, Vince, uh, Shane, you know, Linda's gone. Uh, thank goodness for that, but uh, yeah, there's no need. It, it's been done. It's been 20 years, right? Like we're good, right? Exactly. Uh, there's, it's no need for Stephanie to come out and and push all the guys around and then leave because she thinks she can. Even Vince didn't do that. Yeah, and she'll be on screen at WrestleMania in some role, so she can uh cash a cash a big time check and yeah, uh, and emasculate somebody. So yeah, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> Ronda's got to break her arm. That's what it's going to come down to. Um. Now let's move over to SmackDown because they have more immediate. Uh, and now with the guys, with the fact that we had the Thanksgiving week, our next episode in two weeks, we will have a Clash of Champion preview because it'll be the the Wednesday or Thursday, depending on when we record before the show. So Thanksgiving worked out, and we will have uh, we'll do a preview in two weeks. Now, um, Starcade happened over the weekend, the big show that no one saw. Uh, at, uh, at, in, in Greensboro, uh, Nate was, was devastated as was I, and I'm sure Steve, you, I know you, you were too, that we didn't get to watch it. I have a feeling they may edit and package, probably throw it on the network, maybe in a couple months, you mm-hmm. know, probably cheaper to do it that way. I do know that I've read that this, that this was kind of a test run to do Stuff like this. I mean, we, we've seen it, what, twice? They had the show in Japan yeah, uh, in the summer of 14 on 4th of July. And then they did, in 2015, they did the house show at the Garden. Which makes me wonder, I don't know why they didn't just do the same thing here. You know, simple set, simple, you know, couple cameras, uh, simple entrance. What's what's the what's the big deal? You know what I mean? I don't, know, I don't understand what the... Saying they can't afford, I mean, that scares me. If you if you just didn't want to do it, then just say you didn't want to do it. But to, I think the last reasoning you'd want to give is that you don't feel like spending the money. That's, that's not <laughs> – it makes me yeah, a little nervous. It's not a good thing to say publicly. Yeah, it kind of makes me – we'll have to talk to Brandon about that, Nate, on our net when he's back on in a couple months with the fourth quarter report. Uh, what kind of lie is that? That's that's not good. Yeah. Um, here are your results. Uh, Bobby Roode uh, defeated Dolph Ziegler uh, with uh, – Good old double A and not Armento. A uh, double A is the special outside enforcer, and then he dropped I a. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I, I watched that Spinebuster fifteen times. Yeah, it was, it was fucking great. I loved it. <laughs> it was fucking and, uh, great. Sh- shout out to Dolph Ziggler for uh, selling that like he was dead. Yeah, no, it was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, 
here was a 12-man tag match. The Bludgeon Brothers, which is Harper and Rowan. What a silly... Doesn't it sound like a nickname the Harris Brothers would have? You know? <laughs> that- Honestly, though, uh, for... This might have been the only time the the Bludgeon Brothers felt like they belonged on like on a semi nostalgic show. Like they felt like they belonged. Right now, guys, you both would appreciate this being Marvel or DC, you know, uh, comic fans. Uh, now the Harris Brothers could be the Bludgeon Brothers on Earth X. Oh, you like that, huh? <laughs> Slip that in there. What do you think, huh? Um, well, like, especially since we're fighting Nazis in that. Uh, well, or, that was my point. That well, Beautiful. Steve, that was my point. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you were setting that up. I, you, you, you get the you get the cut of my jibe. So, <laughs> which by the way, and I said this very. I'm going to detour just briefly. I said to my buddy today. Um, did you guys watch it? I did not yet. I'm like so far behind now. Okay. On those did you watch it, Nate? Oh yeah, I watched it. Okay. Let's just put it this way, Steve. I'm not tipping my hat to anything, so don't worry about it. Sure, sure. Honestly, Nate, they might as well not bother doing another crossover again because they're not going to get it any better than they did here. They might as well not bother. And they, you know, and I know they're going to. I know they're, I'm not that naive. I know they're going to. But come on, be honest. It's not going to get better than what they did here. I'm, I'm going to go a step further and say I like the crossover better than I like Justice League. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about Justice League in a little while, but um, <laughs> but I mean, I've, I've heard I've heard more than one person say that today. Yeah. No, I mean it was they. <laughs> Honestly, the choreographing of the fight scene in the fourth part on on the episode yep. of uh, Legends was better than anything that anything Justice League had beaten up. Uh, what's his face? Matterhorn, or whatever the hell his name was. Um, <laughs> Steppenwolf. Steppenwolf. I'm surprised they didn't do some cheesy Born to be Wild music or whatever. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, so anyway, it was the Bludgeon Brothers, Mike Kanellis. <laughs> I'm sure he's regretting leaving, uh, leaving Ring of Honor. The Colognes and Rusev. With eight in English. The fuck is that about? I don't think I, I guess I haven't watched SmackDown in the last few weeks. Defeated Breezango. Oh, he's Sin- like a Rusev's hype man now. Oh, okay. Breezango, Sin Cara, The Ascension, and Ty Dillinger, 12 man tag. Uh, Naomi defeated Tamina. Uh, Dustin Rhodes came out, but he did not come out as Goldust. He came out and, you know, call me the natural. Bro. Hey, Dad! Came out in uh, Nate Milton's favorite outfit. The, uh, he came out as the natural. Kicking it old school WCW style. And he defeated uh, uh, Dash Wilder. Uh, Shinsuke beat B- Baron Corbin by DQ for the U.S. title. Um, the Usos defeated the New Day. Chad Gable and Shelton Benjamin and Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn in a fatal four-way tag match for the SmackDown nickel belts. Uh, Charlotte beat Natalia by submission to keep her SmackDown women's title. And in the main event, AJ uh, defeated uh, Jinder uh, by escape in a steel cage match uh, for the WWE uh, title. Uh, obviously, none of us can comment on whether the show was any good. I'm sure it didn't suck, so I'm sure it was pretty awesome. Um, Clash of Champions is in a couple weeks. I, I don't know where it is, though. Uh, do we know where it is? I will look it up as we're talking here. Yeah, I, I think it's not L.A. That was just somewhere else. I'm not sure where it is. Um, right now, the only match we have is the rematch from Starcade. Jinder Mahal officially on camera gets his rematch uh, with AJ for the uh, WWE World Heavyweight title, which, of course, AJ will um, retain, most likely. Uh, in retrospect, and let's be let's be fair, Brother Nate. We're a fair bunch here. <laughs> he knows where I'm going with this. All right, we have a bookend now, so it is over from beginning to end, from Backlash to that SmackDown. Here we go. Jinder had to be champion, so you can't say so. So you can't say a better thing to do would be to not give it to him. You can't do that. But you're a better man than that. I know you. <laughs> what would you have done to make this title reign better? All right, you're 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 uh, you're a SmackDown Booker. They're telling you, look, Jinder's winning at Backlash. He's going to hold it for six months. Do something. All right, what would you do? And not quitting doesn't count either. Oh, <laughs> uh, see, it, the problem is, I think, for the most part, with the gender run, I think they did about as well as could be expected. I think, you know, there are some, there might be some minor changes I would have made. Like, I think the Nakamura feud and the like, the quasi racist stuff. Like, I don't think that worked. Mm-hmm. I don't think it. I don't think it got the heat that they wanted. 
for gender. Uh, but for the most part, I thought they did a good job with him. I think maybe other than fixing the Nakamura feud, I would have had him, I would have done more uh, location shoots with gender. You know, if this is the guy that's supposed to be like, he's this literal world champion, he's the champion of the world, I would have had more shoots with gender outside of the arena, you know, in, in Times Square or uh, Harvard Square. I don't know where I'm going with all these squares, but... Uh, I, <laughs> Hollywood I, Squares. I mean, Hollywood Squares. <laughs> uh, who was the uh, host of Hollywood Squares? Well, at my age, it was Chuck Woolery, but I don't know who the hell yeah, was. was. I think Whoopi Goldberg did it for a while. Yeah, she did. well, she went from the center square to the podium because she was on too much anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, have uh, yeah, have gender on the view is where, John, what we need. John Davidson. Is, John Davidson, that's right. John it was somebody Davidson, with puffy yes. hair. Yes. yes, he looked like Eric Bischoff. Yes, he did. Uh, <laughs> like 1989 Eric Bischoff, yes. Yes, I think, uh, you know, have gender out in the in the world more, that might have helped. But ultimately, and, and I'm not one who had the biggest problem with gender. My issue, as we talked about on the show, Scotty, is I would have never taken it off of AJ. But right. being that they did, I think they did the best they could, all things considered. Now, Steve, you're handed the book. <sighs> Yes. <laughs> and no, having Knock beat him the next day doesn't count either. Ah, um, oh, damn it. Why did I think of that? No. No. You guys got to earn your money, for God's sakes. All right? Freddie Prinze booked, for God's sakes. If you if he could do it, you could do it. Um, <laughs> all right. They're telling you, look, uh, Jinder's winning it at Backlash. He's beating Orton, and he's going to hold it till November-ish. Um, or October-ish, whatever it was. Uh, do something with it, Steve. What would you have okay. done better? Well, I, I have to agree right off the bat. Like the racism stuff does not; it, it didn't fly. It was, no. it was it was low hanging fruit and and just reeked of desperation. Right. Um, I I have a couple ideas. One is like I was fine with Randy Orton stuff uh, with fighting him. Um, maybe do a program with like a Zane. Um, more so than they did. Like, you do that as a pay-per-view match. You know, n- not, like, uh, keep it away from AJ as they did until the end. You needed, the, I, I was fine with where it ended because Brock AJ is a huge draw. Brock Jinder is not a huge draw. And you have limited dates with Brock left. So you want to make those matches mean something. Um. <sighs> They could have just done a better job of mixing it up as opposed to, okay, here's another Shinsuke match. Here's another Shinsuke match. Here's another Shinsuke match. Because at that point, it's not like you're burying Nakamura, it, but you're you're definitely lessening his star power or by having him completely lose several times to him. Um, if they would have just, hey, I'm Jinder Mahal. I am better than everyone here. I will just destroy all of SmackDown. And you put him in, like, odd matches. Put him in with Rusev. Put him in with um, Baron Corbin. You know, have him have him go every couple weeks defending the title against other people until he gets to uh, an AJ and loses. Have him knock off Nakamura, but maybe just once. Or if you really want to get crazy, have him refuse to uh, defend the title in the United States. Mm-hmm. Like hey, like uh, you don't, you're not giving me any uh, any credit here. You're you're putting me down. So kind of pull uh, a Brett ninety seven sort of. Yeah, I will defend in Canada. I'll defend in Europe. I'll defend you know in Asia. Uh, but I, and they do enough uh, international tours where they can do that. And he could even do it on the Raw brand. Like hey, they're going to Europe. I'll go over there and do it. Um, it just yeah, just don't. And, and maybe it's a problem with the roster being uh, less people on SmackDown, but don't just have them beat the same two guys over and over and over right. again. And they got to start realizing, and I know they do it more for you know xenophobic or whatever purposes, but I we make fun of the Punjabi prison match because it looks dumb. But yeah, the reality of it is, you really can't. It's not a good match. Hook. It's not. You can't really do anything with it. It's a very difficult match to book. It's a very difficult gimmick to book. They just shouldn't do it. It's got nothing to do with the fact that it looks stupid with all the bamboo and the stupid spikes at the top. You just you just can't do it. It's not it's not a hell in a cell. It's not a regular cage. You got all these layers. It, it it's just not a good gimmick to book. And the minute we had to watch Taker and Big Show in two thousand six, when neither of them had anything to do with India. Um, you should have realized that they should never have done it again. Now, the following year, 
Batista and 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 uh, Kali actually, eh, I don't hate it. But I was a, I'm a big Batista guy, so. Uh, but they never should really book that that gimmick again. It's just not a workable gimmick. It's it, it's very hard for that to come off. First off, you have no the, and the camera angles are bad because you can't have. I mean, there's not a lot of room between the the inside cage and the outside cage. You're having camera guys run around. It's it's just logistically, it's just not a good gimmick to book. It just doesn't work. And maybe that's why Vince always thought that way about War Games. But War Games is different because you have you you know it's only one cage. It's just really big. Yeah, and the difference with War Games is War Games actually had equity built up in the name. Like exactly. Even, even with that terrible '98 War Games, like people still remembered it fondly. I don't like outside of maybe that Batista match. There's no fond memories of the Punjabi prison. No, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. I agree. I agree. So, uh, sadly, that match at Battleground with Orton. I mean, we saw three Orton matches for Christ's sakes. Um, yeah. I mean, that was just. Uh, it was like three, three Orton and two Nakamura, right? Yeah, three Orton and one Nak. Oh no, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, whatever was after No Mercy, Money in the Bank, Money in the Bank. Um, what do you think of Nak right now, Steve? Honestly, is he okay? Do, should we be worried? He looked um, good at I, he looked good at Survivor Series. He looked good at Survivor Series. They oh, made he him, looked great at Survivor Series. He looked like he was having a blast. Like yeah. when he uh, when he had that stare down with Balor, like I mentioned earlier, and then when Triple H came into the ring, yeah, and he was just kind of saying, "Bring it!" Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, I never knew until recently the no pun intended the Naka Nakamura that he would only show up a lot for big matches in Japan. Like he'd kind of phone it in. Uh, more on the tour, and I'm beginning to understand that um, knock on him now. So, I, I think that he can be built back up. Um, I kind of remember them doing a little bit of this with AJ last year, where mm-hmm. they kind of put him back down after, uh, right? You know, after he well, he worked with Jericho and just kind of was middling in the mid card. And I think it's just one of those Vince McMahon things, like, hey, you're coming up, we'll do the big intro, but you got to prove yourself here. Uh, not many guys that just debut right away, right on top, stay on top. Mm. So he's over enough and popular enough, and his theme song alone is over enough oh, yeah, that he course. can be built up pretty easily. And if AJ is keeping the belt, you know, they're really trying, uh, AJ and Nakamura are really trying hard to uh, get that match at WrestleMania to do be able to do it on U.S. soil. And uh, then I think he'll really bring it. Yeah. What yeah, do you think, I, I uh, think, Brother Nate? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, the problem to me with Knock is he's got a little Randy Orton in him. And what I mean by that oh, is... Oh, that's the worst. What is the matter with you? <laughs> oh, that's terrible. What I mean by that is Orton's a dude that will rise or fall to the level of his competition. Oh, I see what you mean. Right, right. Like when Randy Orton's in there and he's motivated and he's got a good opponent like a Cena or somebody like that, Randy Orton is, is fantastic. But when he's in there with somebody like a Bray Wyatt, you get what you get. And I think that Nakamura has some of the same qualities to him. Like, we've seen this dude have fantastic matches before, not just in Japan, but also in this country and on NXT. Uh, and so I think the fans are still behind him to a certain extent. We saw that in Survivor Series. And if they go for AJ and Nak at WrestleMania, that reaction will be insane in front of that audience. My worry, though, with Nak is, like Steve said, too often, and I don't, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just the way things are. The WWE has a Vince McMahon mentality. And, you know, some people, it seems, have to jump through these hoops while others don't. And so, like Roman Reigns, to me, is somebody that I don't feel had to jump through the same kind of hoops Knock has. Right. Or even Randy, Randy Orton, you know, using that example. Because, to me, those are their homegrown guys. So they're going to give them every opportunity to, to succeed. Whereas with Knock. I feel like being a big star outside of the company, while it has helped him, I also think there's some in the office that are kind of like, yeah, what's what's the big deal about this guy? You know, you got to prove something to me. And so it's it's part of the company, and it's also partly on Nakamura himself. Like, you know, if, if they're not giving you the opportunities, then you can't, you know, just kind of sleepwalk through matches with Baron Corbin. You know, you got to go out there and, and be hungry and grab the brass ring, so to speak. So, uh I would hope that they they are not souring on Nakamura because there's so much money in this dude 
Uh, there's so many poten- so much potential for interesting feuds with this guy, and he doesn't like he doesn't have the the longest uh, <laughs> the longest amount of time left on his bunk guard. You know, he's, mm-hmm. he's he's not getting any younger. So to me, it's it's like we like when we had that AJ uh, discussion a couple weeks ago, Scotty. Yep. Use this use this guy for for all you can right now because there's money matches on the table, and, and if there's a personality conflict or something petty backstage. You got to throw that out the window, man, because the, at the end of the day, it's about making money and getting these fans interested in these matchups. And so, yeah, I, I hope they don't sour on him, but I could easily see this as a situation where Nakamura becomes a, a mid-carder for you know the, the foreseeable future. Mm. You know what you do get, though, with Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt? LED cockroaches. <laughs> oh, God, I forgot all about so, that. You know. and, and refrigerators. And refrigerators, yeah. <laughs> And and uh, arson, yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> great discussion, guys. And uh, we'll get more into AJ. And uh, I don't want to go too long with the segment. We got a lot of good stuff in segment two. But uh, in two weeks, we will dive back in. We'll preview Clash of Champions once the card is kind of fully materialized. The only thing I will say one thing quick because uh, Steve knows. I'm not sure if you know Nate, but Steve knows I'm a big mark for belts. I own five of them. Um, you earned them. I have. Damn right, I have. Um, all of them at the same, not at the same time, but all my travails. Um, beat Ultimo Dragon. Exactly. Oh, that'd be sweet. Get all eight belts. Get all eight belts. Uh, <laughs> there was a, um, I think it was more like a troll job or whatever, but on Lords of Pain today, this is Rotella got loop, uh, did this to me and kind of roped me in today. Um, I guess there was a rumor that Baron Corbin will be getting a new U.S. title belt. And then there was a picture of a, of a house show, SmackDown house show somewhere. And the belt, it actually looked pretty damn awesome. It looked like a U.S. version of the Intercontinental title. Same shape, you know, the same kind of, because we all know the IC belt's fucking great. Um, but it turns out that it was some guy on Reddit made it, so. <laughs> so I'm heartbroken. But and I, but I'm, I wasn't, I think I had a right to be uh, uh, duped because you know how WWE is right now. They want everything to look the same. So I figure that they want the two mid-card belts to look exactly the same, since the two world title belts look the same, the two women's belts look the same, the two tag belts look the same, the cruiser belt just is kind of there, and I thought that they would want the two mid-card belts to look the same. I, I'm scared that it, I'm scared that at some point we're going to lose the cool IC belt and get some piece of crap like we did in '98. Um. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. I mean, I like the U.S. belt now. I mean, I my favorite U.S. belt, and I think I've said this in the past. Maybe I haven't told you, Nate, was the the one that uh, I guess Magnum got it right after '85. Remember the the mm. you know the kind of goldish one with a circular side paint. I love that. That might be one of my favorite belts of all time. Is that U.S. belt? Yeah, I, I thought you were going to go for the spinner belt. I figured you were a spinner. Ha! I actually <laughs> like the spin. Actually, of the two of the two piece of shit spinner belts, that's the one I hate the least. I actually like the U.S. spinner belt. Uh, the other one, yeah. I'm not. Even, we're not. We don't talk about that on the show. But uh, the 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 U.S. spinner belt, I actually didn't have a problem with. I thought it was pretty cool. Um. But no, the, the I guess you know like Magnum had it, and then it went through to like Luger, and then I, and I was yeah. at a I was at a restaurant in Atlanta, and I, I eventually it eventually got I think Nikita attacked Luger and like destroyed it, and then of course it got he got the belt that we would eventually have throughout the rest of WCW's run. I have that belt, um, and actually at uh, it's a restaurant down in I don't think it's open anymore, but there's a restaurant down in Atlanta. I think it was called uh, not Rack and Roll. What the heck was it called? I can't think of the name of it. Oh shit. It was owned by a bunch of Atlanta, like athletes. Like I think Craig Sager actually had a piece of it. Mm. Might have been, um, I don't know, like Steve Barkowski and I don't know uh, a bunch of Braves and maybe Dominique or somebody. And and uh, they had like different. They had some pictures and they had like uh, they had two uh, like shadow box displays of belts. One of them was the tag team belts that the Road Warriors beat uh, got from the. Midnight's in, what was it, September 88, I think, or October 88. And then the U.S. belt cracked that Nikita attacked Luger with. So it was pretty cool. Anyway, I, I digress. But that was that, that was a story I saw in Lords of Pain today. Uh, you know, somebody said, oh, they saw this belt and ended up some moron that <laughs> slapped it on a house show poster and, <laughs> and thought, thought he tried to, like, dupe everybody, including me. I fell for it because I just love belts. So anyway... Uh, guys, when we take a break, Steve, you want to stick around for segment two? I would enjoy it. Ah, oh, be awesome. We'll take a break. When we come back, uh, we will uh, we will leave WWE, 
And uh, we hope, uh, we're, we're, we're working on it at the moment, but we are hopefully going to have Aaron George on, my favorite Canadian, uh, because he was at uh, Bound for Glory, and he was at the Impact tapings after it. So we want to get a little insight on that. And then, uh, guys, we'll talk about our two brand new segments that we're going to rotate uh, on segment two of Main Event involving Impact Wrestling. And, yes, guys, I'm finally going to dip my toe, uh, finally, in the New Japan waters. Uh, they're very cold. Uh, so we'll get to that uh, right after the break. Brother Nate, Brother Steve, Brother Scott. More Main Event after this. Because... Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, pro wrestling announcer Kevin Kelly here. I want to make sure you are all subscribed to all the great feeds here at Place to Be Nation. It's really easy to do. Just head to iTunes or your preferred podcatcher app today and search and subscribe to the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, which, of course, includes the full archives of the Kevin Kelly Show, the Place to Be Nation pod feed, and the pro wrestling only feed. Subscribe, listen, and then rate us and leave feedback today. And be sure to give Justin your true thoughts. I mean, don't hold back. After all, he is kind of a jerk. Just listen to Scott. Play Simulations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have a ton of great podcasts available to you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaySimulation.com. And we offer those to you on three great feeds. On the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, we bring you the Mothership, the original Place to Be podcast, as well as main event, Lucha Afterground, and our monthly pay-per-view reaction shows, as well as the Our Vantage Point podcast and Jeff Learns Wrestling. In addition to these full-length shows, we also deliver quick-hit pod blasts on topics old and new. Over on the Pro Wrestling Only feed, we dive deep inside the wrestling business with a stacked army of experts leading the way. The feed features potpourri shows such as This Week in Wrestling, Greetings from Allentown, Psychology is Dead, Puro Puri, Stacy and Elliot's Bogus Journey, and the Military Industrial Suplex. We also have shows that focus intently on certain topics like Letters from Center Stage, Space City, and NWA Classics on Demand Adventure, Through the Years, Strong Style History, Strong Style Story, and Mount Olympus. Plus, the feed has the full archives of legendary shows like Titans of Wrestling, Where the Big Boys Play, Letters from Kayfabe, and much more. And on our popular Place to Be Nation Pop podcast feed, we offer such great shows as the Glenn Butler Podcast Hour Spectacular, Rank and File, PTBN Dadcast, Go Home in a Box, NBA Team, and Lucha Undead, as well as a vertible podcast heaven for comics fans with the hard-traveling fanboys, Sellers Points, Todd Weber's Conversation, Geek and Sassy, and Imaginary Stories Podcasts. You can find all of these current shows plus archives of our past podcasts, including The Kevin Kelly Show, as well by subscribing to all of our feeds on iTunes. And while there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows plus others available on PlaceMination.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth stretch projects and more. Be sure to support our site by using PlaceMination.com backslash Amazon when shopping online and download our free PTB Vintage Vault Refresh eBooks via the links on our site. We also want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar in West Warwick, Rhode Island, and Fall River, Massachusetts, TheHistoryWrestling.com, and Scott Keats' Blog of Doom. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr as well. PlaceMation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Regulators. You regulate any stealing of his property. We're damn good, too. But you can't be any geek off the street. You gotta be handy with the steel if you know what I mean. Earn your keep. Regulators! Mount up. It was a clear black night, a clear white moon, Warren G was on the streets, trying to consume some skirts for the E, so I could get some phones, rolling in my ride, chilling all alone. Just hit the east side of the LBC. We are back on Place to Be Nation's main event, Godfather, Scotty, the inimitable Steve Willie in the building, and of course this is episode 89, the Doug Baldwin 
episode. <laughs> I, I think that's that's all the eighty nines we got. Yeah, yeah well, I, I don't. Well, the, the guy that we have on now uh, for this segment, uh, Nate, probably knows a few either Montreal Canadiens, Ottawa Senators, uh, maybe some Maple Leafs. Um, maybe there's because you know a lot of hockey players usually wear. Uh, high numbers, but why don't you bring in our uh, our guest here? Because we have a we have a a great uh, subject to discuss. Bring him in. I will, and uh, you know I'm I'm a spiritual man, fellas. I don't know if you know that, so I don't believe in happenstance or coincidences. So I I don't think it's any shock that this gentleman happens to come back around when uh, a particular universe is about to get broken. Uh, but we won't talk about that this week. <laughs> <laughs> what we are going to talk about, of course, is. Bound for Glory and the fallout from Bound for Glory, uh, Impact Wrestling's latest foray into the world of pay-per-views. And uh, full disclosure, I have not been up on my TNA lately. I finally caught up on this show, and so I figured we had to bring somebody back on here to enlighten us, to to bring us wisdom. Uh, he's our very own deity. You know him, you love him. The one and only Aaron George. Hey, Aaron, good to talk to you again, brother. Yes. <laughs> By the way, the player you are looking for is named Alexander Mogilny. Oh, yes. He is an 89. He played for the Buffalo Sabres and um, the Vancouver Canucks. Now, Nate, you don't believe in coincidences, but today is Alexander Mogilny's birthday. What? No, that's not true. But imagine. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> You're the only person I know that I believe. So. <laughs> 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 oh man, it's, it's been a while since, since we talked, brother, and, and uh, I'm glad we we got this talk to you tonight because uh, I I need somebody to help me, man, because I I've, I've been a little uh, a little down on the impact product, and I need somebody to help lift my spirits. Why? Why? <laughs> it's so in, it's so compelling. <laughs> uh, well, you were at Bound for Glory, which was yes. What was it? Two weeks ago? It was November fifth in no- the metropolis of Ottawa. Notice I was good. I said Uduwa. uh, Uduwa. At the Aberdeen Pavilion. Where the hell is that? That's not not where the Senators play, right? No, are you out of your fucking mind? (laughs) 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 So so let me set the stage for you, my friend. Um, I can't wait for this. Senators. I cannot wait for this. Um, So it's in this really posh part of town, this new, like, hip part of town. And you pull up, and there's this giant football stadium where the uh, the Ottawa Red Blacks of the CFL play. I thought they were the Rough Riders. If, well, hold on. If you think Red Blacks is a bad name, they used to be called the Rough Riders, but there was a, the, the Saskatchewan also had a team called the Rough yes, Riders. Yes, they did. Yep. So two teams with the name Rough Riders in a nine-team league. <laughs> it's a problem. Uh, so you pull up to this football stadium. one of them owned by DMX, by the way. No, not one of them. It's not even spelled uh, that way, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fairness, one of them was one word and the other one was two words. So, <laughs> branching out. So, you pull up to this football stadium and right away you're like, I know it's not in here. <laughs> it's cold, number one. And then there's this tiny barn beside the stadium. And, and that is where <laughs> TNA's WrestleMania was held. In this barn. A nice barn. Like, I, there's no animals inside, but it was, it's, I think they use it now for, like, like really expensive weddings and, and stuff like that. Right. So, so you walk up, there's this lineup, and you, you get in, and the first thing you see on the right is a line of porta-potties. Like, that's the, those are the bathrooms yes, for the evening. Yes, I saw that, I saw that picture you posted in our chats. That, that just speaks volumes. <laughs> yeah, it all up. Um, and, I, and, I, and I would wager that backstage there was porta potties for the wrestling. Yeah, I'm surprised there wasn't a trough. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> pissing one of those like big tubs. Part. <laughs> yes. Like Stan Hansen checking out your dick. While yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and because he's blind, he thinks it's like seven, seven fucking feet long. <laughs> Giant beater. <laughs> um, so beside the porta potties is their concession stand, which. Um, there's maybe two shirts and uh, wow a, pro- a ten dollar program which if you've ever gone to see a broadway show like in new york that's the program wow and they're charging 10 bucks for it holy crap and so we go in and i'll be honest when we walked in it looked great like it looked it looked like the i'm sure you saw it on tv mm-hmm. if any of you are bothered to watch it <laughs> it looked like it looked like the impact zone um 
So we go in and we, we sit down and we're in the bleacher section. And um, if you watch the show, you can, you can actually see us the whole show. We're right on the hard camera side and we're just acting like assholes all night. Um, but the first thing they did when we got in is there was a kindly old woman uh, handing out signs for us to hold out. <laughs> and, wow. And I, I laughingly said, wait, are, are you handing these out? I was like, yes, you know, and if you really want to be on television, you'll hold them up. So, Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> and, oh, my God. And the signs they gave us were amazing. Like, and if you watch right off the top, you'll see me standing up with that sign for a good solid three minutes blocking the guy behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the, my sign said, welcome to Canada. <laughs> they made. And my Fitting. buddies. I mean, my buddy sign just said the word A with an exclamation mark. <laughs> you should have actually had like, you should have had like placebination.com written under Welcome to Canada. We, 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 could, we could branch out to other countries. It's perfectly fine. We have. What am I saying? <laughs> but no, and, and so, yeah, like that's how the night started. And we were on these wooden benches all night. And, um, and the show, I mean, did you, did you guys watch the show? I didn't see it, no. Nate, yeah, I, I finally got around to watching it last week. Mm. Here's a, here's the results for all of you listeners. This is what we got: uh, Trevor Lee defeated Desmond Xavier, Garza Jr., Matt Seidel, who we know who that is, Petey Williams, he's still there, and Sanjay Dutt, he's still there. Uh, in a six way match for the X Division title, Trevor Lee still your champion. Uh, Taji Ishimori, Ishimori defeated Tyson Ducks. Missiles match. Abyss def- Abyss is still there. Defeated Grotto in a monster. They still do Monsters Ball. Good grief. Uh, since Grotto lost, his work visa will be terminated. He must leave the United States. <laughs> Not even in the United States. <laughs> That's fantastic, even though the show isn't even there. Um, Team Impact, which is uh, EC3, Eddie Edwards, and my man James Storm, defeated Team AAA, El, El Hijo del Fantasma, Pagano, and Tejano or Texano, in a six-man tag. Ohio versus Everything, which are the Christs, uh, defeat LAX to retain the uh, Impact World Tag Titles in a 51-50 street fight. Gail Kim Fuck. beat Sienna and Allie in a three-way match for the Impact Knockout still. <laughs> Allie with an I. Allie with an I. Uh, Lashley and King Mo uh, with uh, American Top Team and Dan Lambert defeated Moose and Steven Bonner. In a Six Sides of Steel tag team match. And in the main event, uh, Eli Drake retained the Impact Global Championship with a win over Johnny Impact, who we all know who that is. Anything stand out, Aaron, in any of these matches? Anything you particularly liked before we get to Uh, everything else? Okay, well, hold on. Let me just say that as much as I've kind of shit on it so far, the overall experience was actually a lot of fun. I can see that. Going to see the show live, sitting as close as we did. I spent the whole night screaming at the wrestlers. Like, like, it was a lot of fun. Like, if you watch the, there's an Alberto Del Rio promo. And if you watch it back, you can clearly hear me yell that, that like, his life isn't fair, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Because he's he's bitching about all the losers in the back. And, like, um, but no, it was fun. It was really fun. Um, That being said, uh, I would say the first match, the um, the X Division match, was pretty fun to watch live. There's a lot going on. Petey Williams was hugely over because he was Canadian, uh, but he it was it was lame. Like it's very anytime they did anything pro Canadian, it was clearly it was so transparent that they were just begging for us to cheer. Um, Tyson Dukes versus uh, Ishimori. Ishimori is like a big guy in Japan, right? And he's very good. But throughout the whole match, Laurel Van Ness uh, was walking through the crowd acting drunk. And she came up to me and my buddies and, like, I think I caught her off guard because I I looked her right in the eyes and genuinely asked if she was okay. (laughs) And she she took a second before telling me to fuck off, basically. Um, uh, What were the other matches? The Christ, the Christ Brothers, they, um, they, in the 5150 Street fight, whatever that was, uh, the whole match, you couldn't see anything. Like you, they were you, fighting uh, all around. They're fighting all around, and the crowd was cr- chanting "Can't see shit" the whole time. Um, so I took that as an opportunity to just kind of walk around the building because <laughs> there's no security. 
<laughs> so I went over and yelled at Josh Matthews. Uh, they deserve it. Because I hate him. He blocked me. He blocked me on Twitter. So I went and yelled at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I just kind of walked around and, and stuff like that. Um, I assume they just played Van Halen during the whole match. Oh, man. Before <laughs> before the before the, the show, playing these fucking re, like, de- remix songs of songs you never wanted to hear a remix of. Like a, like a slow dance version of Brown Eyed Girl. Like, fuck right off, okay? We're a wrestling event. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> what? Brown Eyed Girl. Um... And then when I went back, they were playing the same six night, but we'll get to that. Um, and I would even say, like, every, everything was okay, um, but then the typical TNA things looked like typical TNA things. And what I mean by that is, like, I find that, like, when I watch TNA on TV, there's something about how they film it that makes it look faker than WWE. Mm. And I find WWE has its own problems with the way they shoot things. Yes, they do. Um, I agree. But... But I, I also noticed that guys, watching live, there are some guys that just aren't careful about anything. And what I mean by that is, like, in that uh, trios match with, like, EC3, Storm, and... Uh, Edwards? Edwards, against the, the, the guys from Mexico. Uh, that's awful, but that's what they... That had. was... That's something, something I would do. Those Mexican <laughs> guys. <laughs> that bad of Mexicans. Um, <laughs> No, like, you could, like, they would literally stop selling, and you could see them standing on the apron watching, waiting to come in. And it, it was, I mean, these guys are professionals, so it was kind of weak. Um, there's another moment where, like, someone's about to do, like, um, like, a plancha out of the ring onto the pile of people. And, like, normally, at least, the guys are standing there fighting each other. These guys were just, just standing there waiting. Like, side by side, guys that are fighting each other, just standing there waiting to catch somebody. So that kind of stood out to me. Um, the Grado Abyss match was just abysmal, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, um, and after the show, we walked backstage. Like, we didn't bog walk backstage. We walked around the building, and Abyss was out back smoking a cigarette, like, <laughs> clearly broken down. <laughs> like, and I, we almost bumped into him, so I'm like, hey, good job out there, man, which I didn't mean. I'm sorry, Abyss. I didn't mean it, but I know what to say. And he just was so grumpy. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the main event was okay. Eli Drake. He, I like Eli Drake. He was pretty over. Um, and Johnny Impact. And Johnny Impact's great. And he's, you, you can tell right away, at least live anyway, um, he, he looks and acts like a star. Right. And, and he's, he's so much higher above anybody on that roster right now. Like it's it's not even funny, and it's and maybe maybe uh, Del Rio, you can maybe or, or Patron, he's kind of up there, but it's it's not even the same. Uh, my favorite moment of the match was running up to the barrier and yelling at Chris Math um, Masters until he broke character, which was the best because I told him to stop eating because there were children in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Turn around and laugh. Um, but yeah, no, it was a really fun show to be at live. What was great is it was, we were really close. We're really close to the action. And I would say, aside from that trios match and the women's match, everything looked pretty legit. Like, I mean, the guys in the X Division match are, are quality workers. Trevor Lee is excellent. He's amazing. Uh, yeah. Cy Dal is great, too. You know? Oh, of and course he is. Absolutely. Rest, yep. and the rest of the guys were good, too. But uh, it, it, it was a fun evening. I had a lot of fun going there. Like, for all the cheapness and all the, the shit I, I give it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think just watching it um, as a viewer at home, it came across as maybe maybe an elevated version of Impact. You know, and what I mean by that is the wrestling's fine. Like the wrestling is fair to middling, and sometimes you get a really good match. But the presentation still is is lacking. I think the storylines still are lacking. I think. There was a couple things that were really, really good on the show. I, I continue to enjoy Dan Lambert. I think that guy has uh, quietly become one of my favorite promos. Uh, <laughs> but for for a lot of it, and I don't know, you know, because a, uh, full disclosure, you know, there, there's there's a part of me that can't help but watch this product and and also think about what's going on behind the scenes with Anthem and, and losing money and, and the divorce, the breakup, if you will, with Jeff Jarrett and the layoffs at the Fight Network. And that that colors my opinion of this show. And, and so I think 
I like I like the fact that they're that they have a more no pun intended global view of wrestling, which is something I wish the WWE would do more of. Where you know they've got these partnerships with AAA and and with Pro Wrestling Noah to bring in all these different talent. But at the end of the day, I think you probably had more fun in the building than than most of the viewers did watching at home. Oh yeah, I I can't sit through the show. Like I I, I tried, I've tried to watch it, and I'm like, oh, no, I don't I don't want to see this again. <laughs> it was fine. Like uh, and and it's it's sad because like you're right. It's interesting that they have that global view. But I would say aside from Dan Lambert and America Top Team, they don't treat any of those guys like they're anything special. Mm-hmm. Like Ishimori would throw away to Laurel Van Ness, right? <laughs> and even and he's fighting Tyson Dukes, who's a Canadian wrestler who's great. He was in the Cruiserweight Classic. He's all right, but I mean, it wasn't exactly a featured match. And even even the group of fine gentlemen from Mexico were kind of throwaways. <laughs> next, <laughs> next okay, he tried to match. flower that. Yeah, they were just throwaways. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you, it was strange too because all three of those guys uh, were featured on Lucha Underground and. Yeah. Uh, Ijo del Fantasma was a huge part of the first two seasons as King Cuerno. Pagano was a little lesser. Tejano seems to be a little past his prime. Uh, at least during Lucha Underground, he was. Uh, it was but it's just surprising. Prominent. Yeah, you'd, and you'd think with the six of those guys in the ring, they're all you know, seasoned veterans. Um, you know, EC3 is probably one of the least... Uh, you know, longer-term guys out there. But, I mean, Edwards has been around for a good decade at this point. James Storm's been around forever. So That's the first. I mean, James Storm's know, been around since literally the beginning. Match. You know? Yeah. Literally yeah, the beginning. I, literally the first episode. Yeah. I would wager that the problem with that match it's is that they have so... Breathe, boys. Breathe. Breathe. We're doing Breathe. it. Steve Willie, finish, it your, fin- finish your comment. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's just they have a lot of pieces. They have a lot of great pieces there. So it's uh, it's sad to see, I don't know, such middling cards if and, and middling presentation. Because, like you said, Trevor Lee, uh, Xavier, I saw him in Chicago last month. He, he was a, a surprise. I hadn't really seen him before. Seidel, Johnny Impact, and, you know, Drake, and uh, Ohio versus everything besides their name are pretty good guys. And they're bringing Sam McCallahan with them. They have all these great pieces that they send why they can't put it all together to make something pretty special is beyond me. Hmm. So I, th- I feel like they're not building around those pieces, though. Like, they hmm. build around EC3, who I usually like, but there's just something off with him. Like, I think maybe his body is... It, like his, There's too much muscle on his body now for what his frame is. He doesn't move the same way anymore. And so everything looks labored and, and false to me. Yeah, I think a big part of it is going back to creative. And uh, I I don't know if you guys have ever played a game back in the day called uh, Extreme Warfare Revenge. Yes. It is basically like a booking simulator. And, you know, you were in control of whatever federation you picked, and, you know, you could book the matches, and at the end of each match you'd get a rating or whatever. And, And that went to determine how well your promotion did. And it feels like instead of having a cohesive plan that they're following here, they're talented guys and girls, and they're just trying to plug them into situations. And with very few exceptions, I think, you know, the American Top Team stuff works for me. I think a lot of the LAX stuff works for me. But most of the stories that they're trying to play, and uh, I'm sure Aaron can talk about uh, your, your boy Patron here in a second, but a lot of the things they're trying to put down seems like somebody playing a game that they are not quite sure how, how to win. Yeah, I would actually completely agree with that. And, uh, and it's funny because it is like a, it's like a very boring wrestling game because it's always the same storyline. Wrestler A beats up wrestler B, sneak attacks wrestler B, now they're feuding. And it never goes any, to anything deeper than that right now. Or if it does, it goes to something fucking stupid. Like Grado losing his U.S. citizenship in the capital of Canada. It's fantastic. Yes, and somebody's always mad at the authority. That's that's a constant TNA thing. Yeah, and the authority always seems to be like a, a surrogate for WWE in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Like I don't I don't know if you remember when um, Drew Galloway was there like a year and a half ago, and like he'd be like, "You're not letting us wrestle," and like, "All right, but they are letting you wrestle." <laughs> like, 
like <laughs> clearly talking about like you're not letting us do anything. <laughs> like, oh no, my god! Can't. I never knew me father. Like, it's a lot of that. I never knew me. <laughs> you're pretty good at that. <laughs> oh, you fucking knew me father. <laughs> The question is, Aaron, do any of them talk like Stu Hart? Because if you did that, then... then, you know. Sadly, no. Damn it! Sadly, no. You... <laughs> hey, hey Chris, Chris Masters, you're not, you're not tough, Chris Masters. Hey, fucking... Uh, <laughs> you get the, That's all I asked for. Hey. Oh, God. So, fight with him for that. so, talk about... Um, now, you went a few nights later to the... Yeah. Tapings, same place, I imagine. Yes. Okay. So what happened was, is uh, many times throughout Impact, um, they would tell us that if we, if we showed back up with our ticket at any point during the week, we could get in for free to go see the TV tapings. Right. Jesus Christ. Which, which is in a lot of ways, is better. What ended up happening later in the week, because uh, as I'm sure you guys know, and maybe it's old news now, they put out casting ads for like to get actors to come in and be the audience. Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, I did but see you that. Needed to be a, you needed to be an Ottawa citizen. You needed to be there. They wanted non-union people. There was a lot of a lot of things there. So I went back on the Wednesday night, and I brought my son, who's five, because we've seen the WWE shows there, and mm-hmm. I, I thought I thought it'd be a really fun thing for him to be that close and stuff like that. So the TV taping is interesting because it's filmed a lot more like a television show than it is a wrestling show. There are, obviously, there's wrestling matches, but there were points in the night where they're like, okay, now we're just going to do a bunch of shots of you guys cheering, okay? So everybody cheer as loud as you can. Okay, great. Put those signs up and cheer, and then they'd, they'd film those. Okay, yep. now now we want you guys to all be booing, okay? You guys are all going to boo. So, and, and I, I, before I was there, I, I probably would have judged that as a, as a major negative. Like, oh, how could they be doing that? It's so lame. But being there and seeing that it was more of a television show kind of almost made it okay in a lot of ways. Like, oh, this is what they do. This is what Jay Leno does or did. Fuck, I'm old. <laughs> Jay Leno. <laughs> it's been like, what, six years he's been dead? Like, what? Jay <laughs> Leno. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, it, was a lot, it was a lot like a TV show. And um we, my, my, my son and I, we got there when it started, and we stayed for about two and a half hours, and it was going four and a half hours. So he, he got burnt out. Like, we saw Johnny Impact, like, three times within a two-hour span. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's fine. He's great. He's the best one to see. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, they filmed, like, their explosion show, too. Uh, mm. it, was, it was fun. Like, it, it, it was okay. I was happy I went back. It was cool. It was a different experience. Same porta potties though. Do they at least clean them? I, well, when I switched my hand in there, it looked dirty, but <laughs> I mean, it all looks dirty now. <laughs> it's just the water in Ottawa. Oh, it's disgusting. Put a piece yeah. of shit down. <laughs> I'm wondering, though, Aaron, from like a, like a business standpoint, and uh, you know, granted, uh, the, the anthem entry into the world of pro wrestling hadn't been the smoothest of, of, of trips, but I'm wondering... With them relocating everything to Canada, do you think that this is a, a good business decision? And do you think that this is going to be good for the product in the long run? I don't think anything they do now could be worse for the product. So, so I, think, I think it's interesting because Canada is very much a WWE market and always has been. You know, that's why you see after WrestleMania 18, Hogan get a 10 minute ovation. Oh, absolutely. Show. Yep. Because we, we never saw him, you know, it went with some. But that being said, it's also a market that, that they really ignore a lot of. Like, they ignore entire swaths of the country. Mm-hmm. Like, last year they came to Montreal twice. Before that, they were maybe coming like once every three years, once every four years. Maybe they go to Toronto once a year, maybe Vancouver. But those are three cities. Right, and and it is, doesn't have a ton of major cities, but there's enough, right? Oh, of course. So I think if yeah, like if they wanted, the only problem is they're far apart. But if they wanted to put a focus on being a more Canadian promotion, I think there's something interesting there because I mean, I, I I'm not like this, but like a lot of Canadians really are are like we we want to support a Canadian thing, mm-hmm. like you know in the NHL, like all the Canadian teams go out and the ratings go like 
they go to nothing here on television kind of thing. So I think there's an interesting thing there. Now, it depends on who they keep, who they keep around, what they do. They can't build the promotion around P.D. Williams. Like, it's just not going to work. Um, but I think if they focus on uh, being a Canadian company and with obviously their stuff in the U.S., I think there's something interesting that could happen there, especially if they start touring the rest of Canada. Right. Well, they do well in Europe too. I mean, they do great when they do those uh, those great you know those England tapings. They get make a yeah. killing over there. Even though it didn't shy, didn't they just lose the TV there? Didn't I read that somewhere? Didn't TNA just lose or Impact or Global, whatever the fuck it's called? Didn't they just lose uh, their TV there, Nate? Did you see that? I didn't. I haven't seen that yet. I know that they had uh, re-upped the deals with uh, India. No, they definitely re-upped with India. They make a killing there, probably more than. Maybe maybe gender should be the global champion. They make a day oh, that see that now we're now we're talking because gender needs to be in impact wrestling because not only is he good for the Indian market but he's Canadian. So you've got <laughs> your, your top guy right there. <laughs> and if Nate had his way, he'd do nothing but work the porta potties. So um, <laughs> the <laughs> it's also from the most racist part of Canada. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Um, and the Senators have awful uniforms. But anyway. Um, in and out, in and out. It goes in and out. They have a couple of nice ones, but not now. Ugh. If you ask me right now, if you put a gun in my head, the greatest uh, Canadian uh, NHL jerseys of all time, there's hands down the Laney McDonald Calgary Flames. They shouldn't have added all that black, all that all that extra color and all that crap. They look terrible. They should just went back old school, eight, red, gold. Laney McDonald, baby, Al McGinnis. They wear them as a third jersey. Those ones. It should be a first jersey. Mike Vernon. Yeah. I can lay them all on the yeah, line. Yeah, but you're wrong. You're, you're you're wrong. You're wrong though about the, the best ones. The Canadians one. I know you hate them, but uh, I know, I know, I know. Although that Heritage Classic one, uh, right? Is that what it is? Who, what's the game they're playing? In Ottawa. There, uh, aren't yeah. they playing outdoors or something? Yeah, they call it the Heritage Classic. Yeah, though, though I have to admit, I saw that jersey that they're going to wear, that, that the Canadians are going to wear, and actually it's pretty cool. The Winter Classics look awesome. The Rangers are playing uh, Buffalo at... Uh, how about this for weird? Sorry to go off the path here. The Rangers are no, playing awesome. Buffalo in the Winter Classic at City Field, and it's a Sabres home game. Because apparently, the Rangers cannot play a home game Outside of the garden. It's some kind of weird deal with the Dolans. Well, of course, because they're sleaze balls. So the Sabres get a home game at City Field. Go That's figure. It's so stupid. Next year, Steve Willie, book it. Because D'Amato and I are coming out New Year's Day next year. You know what next year's Winter Classic oh, is? Uh, Hawks and uh, Notre Bru- Dame. Bruins, at, uh, Bruins, Blackhawks, Bruins, Blackhawks in South Bend. I'm there. Um... So would you go again, Aaron? Would you go to another taping? Or would you go to another show live? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I'd go now. I, I would need there to be a bit of a turnover of guys. Like, I, I don't need to see EC3 for, like, a whole night. You know? But if there's a turnover of guys with the, the, the guys I like, absolutely. And go with a group of friends. I brought my son, and he liked it, but not as much as the WWE shows. Mm. You know the most interesting thing about Bound for Glory to me, and, and the most... I guess I got during Bound for Glory Week was, uh, I believe it was Eli Drake, who is, uh, who is underrated. Uh, I, I like Eli Drake. But uh, Eli Drake and I think Josh Matthews were at some bar or restaurant, and EC3 was there, and Moose was there, and they had a barbecue powerbomb pizza. Mm-hmm. And then, like, some TNA Impact shots, and I was like, you know what? That, that's, that doesn't sound too bad. No, it actually doesn't. Well, well there was a bar... Like where it's kind of like where the steam is and the barn is. There's like a little area with bars, and they kept inviting us to the after party at the bar. Like all the re- <laughs> implying all the wrestlers would be there. And at the t- at the taping, what I did notice at the taping was that there was t- like, nobody knew who anyone was, right? Like, at all. <laughs> so what led me to believe is they actually did get actors because like they were clearly holding up signs that they made and they didn't know who to cheer for. But then I ended up talking to a guy and they were just giving out free tickets at all the bars in the area. Oh yeah. man. Interesting. Yeah. But again, like when you look at it as the as what it is, it's a television show as opposed to a wrestling show. Yeah. I don't know how bad a thing that is. I think it's okay. Like I'd like them to be doing better, but 
it is what it is. Mm. Honestly, that is something that I wish they would have done in Orlando. You know, when they first started, to me, when they first got to the impact zone, one of the first things I did was get a street team together and go to UCF and try to get those college kids invigorated in the product. And if you got to give them free tickets, hell, give them free tickets. Because one of the biggest issues I, ha- I had with the impact zone in Orlando was just, you, kn- you knew the regulars were there and the crowd was just stagnant. So I, I think they, they missed an opportunity to get some new life. So if uh, if they have to, you know, get these Canadian actors in there to, to have some uh, enthusiasm, so be it. And we have bombed every city that they can come and do. <laughs> so always have new people. Oh, it's, all, oh, it's perfect. Just have Alberto Del Rio, the barnstorming tour. Just beautiful. <laughs> it writes itself. <laughs> I'm in here with the Asanimals. He can walk around and just talk about his problems for no reason. They said, it. They, they said I did things, but I did not do those things. I'm innocent. See, see. Like I, At first, I was like, is this a, the, the first half of his promo was pretty good. But yeah. the, sec, the last 10 minutes felt just, uh, I was like, is this guy in therapy? That was his therapy. That's what it was. I didn't do anything. <laughs> like, uh, only a guilty person says I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's like uh, a Lex Luthor line. Lex Luthor says I didn't do anything. Superman is putting him in jail. Yes. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so, before we wrap up, and... Uh, Go on our merry way. I want to um, announce that we have decided to have a little fun uh, with our. Uh, we, as everyone knows, uh, we structure the show accordingly. Where we do the first segment of the show is usually full blown W, and then the second segment usually other stuff. Well, we've decided to have a little fun with two major promotions. I guess. Um. And hopefully, Steve Willie, who apparently, is he there, Steve? Or did you totally, I think he totally pooped out. He did poop out. Um, his computer crashed. Must be the, well, how close is Ottawa to Appleton, uh, Aaron? You're not sharing Wi-Fi, are you? No, it's maybe about a 40 or 50 day walk. <laughs> Don't worry, Steve. Steve will be back on the next episode, and he'll he'll cut a Del Rio promo. I didn't do anything. <laughs> it was my Wi-Fi, and they tried to say it was me. Um, and the back, the backstabbers in the back. <laughs> yes, yes, you, you know who I'm talking about. The backstabbers. Bruce Richard. <laughs> Is that what you mean? <laughs> and, oh, and the best part. The best part, Scotty was when he walked over to the announcer's table. JB, why didn't you call me when I was suspended? You were supposed to be my friend. <laughs> kind of like when uh, Batista yelled in uh, Ray's face. Yeah. You were supposed to be my friend. Oh, my God. <laughs> Speaking of Batista, uh, I want. I don't want to get... I don't, I've just started to dive into the uh, to our announcements yet until till Steve can come back. So, um, Aaron, you're a... Uh, a comic and a TV viewer. Did you watch the four-part crossover? Do you watch the four the shows on CW, Arrow and Flash, and all those? No. Well, great vamp job yeah, there. I said, um, I, I said it. I, I said it like that just to ruin <laughs> to ruin the vamping. Ruin. Canadians don't know how to vamp. No, actually, you know what I want to talk about? I, I'll tell you what I want to talk about. Oh, wait, wait for you. I thought um, you were gonna go sit talking about Batista. I thought you were going to the uh, Infinity War trailer. Well, I was gonna go, I was gonna talk about the Infinity War trailer, which is which was awesome, uh, which I'm looking forward to. That comes out May fourth. Um, haven't seen it. It was a great. Because, Just kidding. I've seen it. <laughs> um, well, my two favorite bad guys in all of comics, and that's probably because they mirror each other, are Dark Side and Thanos. Anyway, because they're pretty much each other. I mean, Dark Side is the DC Thanos, and Thanos is the Marvel Dark Side to a certain extent. So I'm a fan of both those. So when I finally the, the trailer where Thanos is actually um, walking through the the gate thing, although it looks like he just went to like a yoga class or like Pilates, he's got this weird like top on. Or I was expecting like the whole full blown fucking armor and all shit and everything. And it looks like he was just on an elliptical. 
<laughs> uh, and the, the greatest tweet about the uh, about the trailer was I think uh, Mina Kimes from ESPN. She was like, uh, she couldn't tell if it was Thanos or Tom Cable stepping out of the portal. <laughs> There's another great um, uh, picture. Like somebody took a, a still shot shot of the trailer where he's got the where you know he's got the Infinity Glove on, and, yes. he, and he he closes his glove right before he decks uh, Iron Man, and. Um, they painted his face to look like Homer, and they put a donut in his hand. It was actually pretty cool. Oh. It was actually pretty funny. Uh, are you back, Steve? I am back. All right, good. Uh, we were, we were... He was back to, to talk about all the backstabbers. <laughs> he was back to cut his Wi-Fi. <laughs> we were trying to... Why didn't you call me? <laughs> we were trying to vamp, but uh, Aaron sucks at it. So, um, we, uh, no, so we... I went to Comcast with my cable bill. <laughs> they said I didn't pay it. <laughs> Uh, your Mexican voice is amazing. <laughs> it, 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 it makes my Mexican the Mexican guy's comment look tame. <laughs> oh god. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a new fun rotating segment. That we're going to do every we're going to do two segments every other month or every other show. We're gonna rotate. And the reason this came into my head is because Nate, when we had on our man Brandon Howard a few shows, a couple shows ago, we were talking about uh, like all the wrestling apps and everything. Yeah, we were talking about the WWE Network in the third quarter. We were talking about WWE in the third quarter report. We'll have Brandon back on, uh, probably after the new year when the fourth quarter report comes out. So we'll probably have Brandon back on mid January. Um, we were talking about different wrestling apps, and as a matter of fact, I had my Fire TV up and I was going through, and I found I didn't realize this. That the New Japan Pro Wrestling World app is on Fire TV, and I was pretty floored by that because I had said for a while, and I, you know, I, I had had it on my desktop at work, and I wanted to look it up, and it is very difficult. I understand it's a Japanese site, duh, but even when you click on like you know, click for English, like maybe nine words turned English, and it's still a lot of Japanese. But the Fire TV is very interactive and very compatible and actually very easy to maneuver. The the interface, I think is the correct word, is actually very good. Now, uh, to to uh, I wanted to do something with it. Like I wanted to expand and this is more for I me. Mean, I don't want to say it's personally my for me, but but you guys are obviously very schooled in you know, New Japan currently in in the past. I admittedly am not. Uh, I watched a few matches uh, that our man will uh, uh, I have a few DVDs, and, and Will had made for me. And one of them was this incredible, like, 10-man gauntlet tag or something in, like, 1984 that we watched, and it was, the match was ridiculous. It's like, fucking 54 minutes or some shit. But I, I wanted to really, so, I think it was you, it was either, Steve, was it you, or was it Chad that, that found this Google sheet for me? Was it you? Um, I did. It was you of, did. Um, yeah, Senor Lariato. Yeah. Uh, who's a pretty big-time uh, guy with uh, GIFs and a uh, recommendations on twitter um had put it out once the njpw world's like ridiculously comprehensive it's yes just, it's not like everything but it's like pretty much everything over three stars okay so what, what we've decided and this is this is the first announcement we are going to do a new japan classic match pick and what we're going to do is is uh we'll rotate um steve me nate anybody who wants to pick a match and we're gonna we're gonna announce the match, and then the following show, we are going to talk about, it. and we'll do a little analysis of it. So it gives you a couple weeks to watch it, and then we'll come back on the next show, and we'll uh, we'll talk about it. We'll you know our analysis, what we thought of the match, the characters, that kind of thing. Which I think is going to be great because you know a lot of our main event listeners, um, obviously very WWE centric because that's you know throughout the history of the show, it's eighty percent of what we talk about. Obviously. We talked about nothing but WWE for a long time when you find gentlemen were doing clotheslines and headlines. So now that we've kind of enveloped the two shows in one, I'd like to kind of educate myself and maybe educate others uh, into the ways of the history of... Now, I'm very old school, like, and I want to dive into those 70s matches. Um, but uh, but we will. So, Steve, I'm going to give you, uh, Nate and I, as co host going to give you the first dib of the first pick to give to our fine listeners and uh, prepare uh, um, for our next show. So in two weeks, we will talk about our first 
New Japan classic match pick. And if we can get it on New Japan, if you have the New Japan World app, awesome. If you don't, I'm sure you can find the match somewhere on YouTube or somewhere. So, Steve, the floor is yours. What is our first pick to watch? Mm. Um, I'm going to go with something that is actually more current. It's this year, but it's earlier on, and I have not watched it yet. And I think it will be a good start because it is very controversial. Mm-hmm. And so I think we could have a lot of different viewpoints. Okay. And that is the April match between Shibata and Okada. Um, mm. It's uh, I know Chad Campbell gave it five hours. Uh, some people think it's horrible, and I don't want to give anything away why that is. Um, but it is a, a highly contentious match. Some are saying that it's match of the year. Some are saying that it is everything that is wrong with professional wrestling. Okay. Uh, to clarify, it is from April. If this is the match I'm thinking of, uh, Steve. It's April 9th, 2017. It's Okada Correct. versus Shibata. At the Sakura, mm-hmm. It's from the Sakura Genesis show at the uh, Rio. I'm going to say this wrong. And, and I apologize. I'm not actually being funny. I, I swear to God I'm not, but I suck at trying to say some of these things. Ryogoku... Kogu Gikan? Ryogoku is correct. Oh, nice. Um, and it's for the... Koyogoku is not correct. Okay, Khan. <laughs> um, and it's for the... I- and it's obviously for the IWGP title, because that's what Okada has. All right, so let's do that. So you got two weeks, listeners. If you can find the match, if you have the New Japan World app, it's on there, I imagine. And uh, if not, I'm sure you could find it somewhere. And we'll be back, Steve. You'll be joining us in two weeks, and we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Now, Aaron's here. Well, Aaron could watch the match too, if he'd like. Aaron's here because of our second announcement. <laughs> 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 yes, and the announcer's going to talk like that for the for the rest of every time we do a New Japan <laughs> match. It's, <laughs> it's my it's my favorite part about watching Tomohiro Ishii matches. <laughs> <laughs> He's just so angry. <laughs> Thank God you're in your car. Um, <laughs> um, like Shogun will be like, "Who's that large Japanese man in my face?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, I've sat here, and bef- and this is before when when we went to an event, Nate, before you came on, when you were still on the other show, and I had Jordan on, and Steve, you were on, Aaron, I think you were on a couple times when I did it, and I I found this awesome site about the history of TNA, and it had, and it was more of like a fun-making site, and there was just some ludicrous nonsense and making fun of Puppet and Cheeks and all those guys, and I'm, and then when we were on with Brandon, the other app that, that, that I came away with was the Fight Network app, ironically, talking about the Fight Network and everybody that they let go, but the app, you know who owns the app? Anthem. Yes. So they have all of the TNA pay-per-views on there, including the original monthlies. Um, and honestly, the, 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 which this is kind of pathetic. The Fight Network app is actually better than the, fucking, than, than the stupid global on-demand thing because that looks like trash. So, um, so on the opposite weeks that we do the New Japan match, we are going to start from the beginning – from that very first TNA pay-per-view on June 19th, 2002 in Huntsville, Alabama. And we're going to do, not, 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 not as in-depth as like JR and I do for the Vintage Vaults. But we're going to sit and we're going to talk about, we're going to do all the, every other week, we're going to do the TNA pay-per-views. So Aaron, yeah. because uh, you're my, you are my favorite Canadian. Because um, you think so little of me that you guys get to watch the cool Japanese <laughs> and I gotta watch guys dressed like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on! But Aaron, I mean, seriously. I mean, the second pay-per-view and the, the, the number two pay-per-view, Cheeks actually wrestled on camera. How? Who else can, can analyze that but you? Seriously. I, I watch the pay-per-view. <laughs> I didn't say you couldn't come on the New Japan ones, too. <laughs> Full disclosure, I have already watched it, and I have two pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve's going to join. So gentlemen, uh, that is our announcement. So every other week, we're going to rotate. One week, we're going to do, we're going to talk about a New Japan classic match, or one from, you know, a new, and classic, I mean, again, relatively speaking, because Steve's pick is from April, so it's kind of classic. And then the opposite weeks, we're going to recap and, and chat about an old 10 
pay-per-view. Because I'm very curious. I really want to analyze um, where the ebbs and flows are. Because I think a lot of us, we, we, we rip TNA to shreds. You're a big fan, Nate, as I, as everyone knows, as are you, Aaron. And yeah, Sure. And I... <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that I think it would be fun to literally document. Now we're not going to do all the impact shows because then I, I think I would put a gun in my mouth. But because those are just most unwatchable shit. But I think a lot of I think a lot of uh, some of these pay per views will give us a good ebb and flow on what was really good about the promotion in their what now almost fifth years of existence and what has been crap. And I think I think it'd be a lot of fun. And so, in a month, we will have we will recap pay per view number one that took place again on June. Let me make sure. I think I got the date right. Actually, June nineteenth, two thousand and two, from the uh, from Huntsville, Alabama. And that, of course, uh, remember all the old school, uh, all the old uh, uh, legends came out and everything. And we got our first taste of Jeff Jarrett and a bunch of other stuff and the whole Toby Keith thing. But I think it'll be a lot of. Because, I mean, I watched it, and the crowd was, like, ridiculous. In fact, the crowd was ridiculous for the first few shows. Yeah. So, I'm fascinated by that. So, guys, it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, every other week, we're going to rotate. So, in two weeks, on our next show, we will, uh, we're will we going to sit down, and Aaron, of course you're invited. Aaron, if I was my head my way, I'd invite you to everything. But apparently, Ooh, thank you. but apparently thank you you can, you're only a lot on making the cut, so you can be belittled for your wrestling opinions. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, because... Your co-host there just likes to belittle everybody. No, I'm only kidding. Um, partially. Oh. Partially. No, I'm only kidding. Um, you won't with us for 18 months. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we'll talk about making the cut in a minute because I love the show. Um, so in two weeks, we will analyze our match, which once again is from April 9th of this year. Um, from the Genesis, Okada and Shibata for the IWGP title. And we'll talk about it. And in one month, on our... Two shows from now, we will sit and we will talk about the very first ever TNA pay-per-view, the first uh, weekly one that took place on June 19th, 2002, from Huntsville, Alabama. And we're going to go from there. So we're going to pull the ripcord and just go to town. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. A lot of fun, as always. Uh, so we're going to have a pretty busy show in two weeks. Uh, we will preview Clash of Champions, the final pay-per-view of the year in WWE, because it'll be upon us uh, that following sun- that coming Sunday. So we'll, do- we'll-, we'll preview that. And we will sit and talk about our first uh, New Japan Classic match pick. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. And if anything pops up, it will get Pete on, because Pete will dive all over this. In fact, we'll try and get Pete for that show. And maybe the five of us could sit and uh, and we'll uh, we'll talk about it. So, all right. Been a pleasure, gentlemen. Uh, anything to pimp? Uh, Brother Nate, Kings of Sport, what's going on? Yeah, Kings of Sport. This is back from Europe, so uh, we've got a big show this week. Uh, and, and we've got uh, his... His review of, I guess, London and, and Paris. And, of course, we'll talk some football. Uh, we, we've got a uh, big football week coming up, both collegiately and uh, in the pros. And, and Eli Manning, I say, man, keep your head up and uh, don't let the backstabbers in the back. Like Ben McAdoo, keep you down. <laughs> man, what hey, a disaster. disrespect is your family. <laughs> what a mess. I'm looking forward but to listening to that. You didn't do anything. <laughs> you didn't do anything. <laughs> Sad that Tiki it actually. Barber didn't call you when you got benched. Where were you, Tiki? <laughs> Where were you, Tiki? <laughs> I'm sure he'll get fired from his radio show for harassing somebody. Um, uh, he could say, "No, it's my brother." Uh, hey. But notice Ronde has a. F- At least they finally figured out that one of them has to have some facial hair. Uh, yes. Ronde has a has a has a beard, and uh, Tiki is clean shaven. But um, so awesome, uh, Steve. What do you got coming up? Uh, I got a little something that's in the bag already for uh, Mission Indie Possible, uh, something similar to what we're doing uh, that we just announced. Mm-hmm. And also, Glenn and I, I will, I will be guest starring in a special episode of the Glenn Butler Tower Spectacular. Spectacular. And Great show. We also had in our minds and the end started to do an advice show. And uh, we are launching it. And it will be called Spectacular Advice. It will be part of this podcast hour. So if you have any questions, anything you need advice on, and it could be anonymous, you can put your name to it. You just have to email spectacularadvice, one word, at gmail.com. And uh, we want to get uh, quite a few questions going. And uh, as we joked about, I'm a nationally certified psychotherapist. 
I will not be using those skills on this broadcast. And uh, and Glenn is just pretty much a sage as it is, and his brother might be joining us mm-hmm. as well. So uh, we hope to be giving out some advice and some completely invalid advice as well. That's fantastic. <laughs> The invalid advice is what I want to hear. And, and you could talk about workplace relationships, particularly at supermarkets. It would be very interesting. Um, Absolutely. Steve, always a pleasure. Mr. George, I Yo. I want to laud you uh, for yours and my P- – I was just goofing a minute ago. But we talked in the first segment about, the, of course, the greatest WWE wrestler of all time project that we're doing at PlaceBeNation.com. Again, uh, just a reminder, make sure everyone's ballots are in by New Year's Eve. So if you're listening to this, as I'm recording, you'll listen to it on – you have 31 days to get your ballot in. And we're going to do a lot of post-mortem podcasts. Nate and I have already decided we're going to do our uh, countdown, our, our lists here. I'm not going to release mine. I'm going to, I'm going to release mine on the show, so you won't see my ballot on, on our Facebook page. I'm going to hold off on it. Um, but if you want to listen to some great pod blasts and podcasts, we've done a boatload. And one great show that I enjoyed very much, particularly the last two episodes, is Making the Cut which is my PIC, Mr. Rosero, and you, Aaron, uh, talking about guys and certain people and kind of comparing and contrasting where they belong on lists and where they don't. And the last two episodes in particular, you guys were fantastic. I thought it was an exceptional, exceptional show. This last one I did, you had a nice debate involving Mick Foley, Punk, and Brett, <clears throat> which I thought was awesome. Uh, cool. I, I just want you. I just want want you to know that. And you had some great points, and Jr. had some great points. It, it was fantastic. So highly recommend listening to what? Making the Cut, and uh, listen to Aaron and Jr. They were they were fantastic. And oh, thanks for that, man. No, Thank it was you. it was awesome. And so if you guys, if you if you guys are still jimmying with your lists, um, and you're not sure of certain guys, check out what are some other guys. Just I know that well. The fifth the, you've done five episodes. The fourth one I know you talked about Vince. Uh, that was fascinating, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we've done it. a bunch. I mean, we at the beginning, we were doing, like, individual guys. Like, we did Vince. We did Savage. We did, uh, oh, God, I can't even remember now. We did Razor. We did uh, X-Pac. We did China. But now, I mean, as you get into your list, you'll see it gets really important about comparing guys to one another. Right. So um, the last one we did, like you said, was Brett Punk and Foley. A lot of fun to do. And I think if we do another one, we're both kind of crunched for time, but if we do another one, there's a good chance it's going to be The Rock versus Michaels versus Cena. So I think versus that's what's Nia in the- Yes. <laughs> he just wants Nia in the fatal four-way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. And then he wants to be in the Fatal Five way, uh, but uh, yeah, no, it was it's it's going to be great. And I think I think we should I think you guys should definitely do ones uh, post uh, now, uh, you know list revealing because I think it'll be really good. And uh, I, obviously you, you'll be on here, and we're going to go over our lists, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So please j- dive into the discussions on the Facebook page. Um, you got again, you got thirty one days because New Year's New Year's by New Year's Eve midnight, January first. Uh, we'd like to get all the ballots in. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's been fun so far. We've had some unusual discussions in some places with some people, but uh, it's been great. It's been a blast, and uh, we're going to have a lot of great stuff even after the the, the official ballots are released. So, uh, Aaron, great job, and keep it up. Uh, uh, anything else you want to uh, – I didn't mean to, to kind of steal your thunder. Anything else you want to talk about? I'm touring uh, with a production of Macbeth. If you want to see me play Macbeth, uh, go to a high school in the Montreal area, and you'll. I'm there. Are you? Is is Jacques Rougeau the narrator? Uh, no, he's King Duncan. I murder him. Yes. In the middle of in the middle of Act Two, and I bathe in blood. So anyway, it's it's a good show for the whole family. You can't kill me. I'm the king. And then you put him. I in- am a Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a better Duncan than the other one that used to be on the show. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I love you, JD. All right, uh, it's been fun, guys. For Steve Willie, for Aaron Jordan, up to my co-host, the Godfather Nate Milton. I am Scott Criscolo. You've been in the main event. We are forging uh, a new and exciting path, and uh, in two months we get to talk about a cheat. I'm pumped. Have a good two weeks. <laughs>